Fantastical question, yeah. Especially based on their uh, thesis. So we can request her to give us some questions. And they can even send the answers or they can write down the questions. Let them at least know how to answer that in 12 minutes. Yeah, each of them can actually write it down and show the local uh, vendor. Yeah. Submit it to the local member. And the most important is the handwriting. You know? Handwriting is one of the most difficult. I hope, I hope all the students are listening to what ma'am is telling. It's one and of the worst things that can uh, examine your face who is correcting the paper. And uh, to help the candidate, we, have to, we spend more time in, in uh, candidates whose handwriting is poor. Those are good handwriting, it's so fast, you know. Finish up in 20 minutes. And those in whom you're not able to understand, you feel the message is there, and if you read between the lines, it takes about half an hour to 40 minutes to correct one paper. It is terrible. Terrible means there's no words to express. Maybe one time I'll project some of the slides a little later after the practicals are over. There's one guy which is appearing for practicals. Okay, they're after their practicals. 120, okay. 24 of them are appearing for practicals. There's one batch of 24 to appear for practicals. So let them finish and then. Yeah. Are the date been announced? Date announced? Yeah, I do not know. The theory correction I heard is over. So, so after that, I'll predict it. It's terrible means there's no word to express. Uh, good evening, NBK. Welcome after a long time. We can't hear you. We can't we can't hear you. Madam? Ah, now we can hear you. Good evening. Good evening, good evening, good evening sir. You're looking good evening. nice, good evening, nice and fresh. Come take over and start. Who's who's who are the presenters? Discussants? Vanilla. Uh, discussants are Vanilla and uh, Majid. Vanilla from Pushpagiri and Majid from Kim's. Okay, can you introduce uh, uh, VT and start? Who is present? Uh, they are presenting the case, their own case? No, no, VT, uh, LBK is taking. Uh, LBK is uh, showing the Taking, yeah. You can just introduce and start. Good evening, sir Sanma. I'm Dr. Benila Jos from Pushpuri Institute of Medical Science, Tirvalla. Who is sharing the slides? Uh, good evening, good evening, ma'am. Um, uh, respected teachers, I'm Majid from Kim's. You are not visible. You are not visible. Uh, MBK, who's sharing the slides? Want me to share? It, sir. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, respected teachers. Good evening. Oh. It's come. Good. We can take over. Okay, who's taking up? Yeah. Uh, case history 51 year old male, self employed from Coimbatore, presented with complaints of yellowish discoloration of eyes for the last one week and right upper quadrant pain for the last one week. Yeah. Can we go on the next slide? No history of abdominal distension, no history of pedal edema, no history of GI bleed. No history of decreased urine output, no cardiorespiratory symptoms, no history of altered sensorium, no history of complementary and alternative medication in there. So you are just, uh, yeah, tell me what do you think, the 51 year old male, he has come to you with uh, progressive uh, yellow dysfunction of one, I think right upper corner of it for one week. Okay. Um, he doesn't have... Uh, any features of decompensation, like there's no abdominal distension. Can you expand on this? Yes, no abdominal okay, distension. Uh, I would like to know about any prodromal symptoms. No, there are no prodromic symptoms. All that he had is a mild right upper quadrant pain and jaundice for one week. Okay. Uh, no, any history of fever? Uh, or No, or no fever. There was no uh, history. Any obstructive symptoms, sir? He had okay. mild pedal edema. Okay. Any obstructive symptoms? No Pardon? Only obstructive symptoms, sir? Obstructive jaundice, pure tests, clear colored stool, anything like that? There was no 
I don't remember. I don't think he had any cholestatic symptoms or uh, <clears throat> he had no uh, clay colored stools or did he have any pruritus? On and off, he had some mild pruritus. Okay, sir. Any history of any drug intake? No, no history of any drug intake. No history of any drug intake. There was no prodrome. He had mild pedal edema. There was no bleed. He came and told us that he did not have any, he had decreased, uh, uh, no history of any decreased urine output. That's what he told. Opposite. And yeah. uh, never, the family did not say, because he was found to be jaundiced, okay. he was brought to us. Okay, sir, any history of intake of alcohol or anything? Let's go into this. Any other thing you want on this? Nothing. Alcohol, history of intake of alcohol. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, can we go to the next slide? There is no. Oh, there was no history of pruritus, clay colored stools, weight loss, okay. no history of any recent blood transfusion, outside travel, or any outside food. Okay. So, somebody comes with a 51 year old, comes with a recent history of right upper quadrant pain and jaundice. What are your possibilities? One is uh, viral hepatitis, sir. Good. Could be viral hepatitis. In the viral hepatitis, which hepatitis do you think? Would uh, be hep hepatitis A. Or hepatitis B, sir. Hepatitis B, and then you are in Kerala, no? Yes, sir. Ha while hepatitis A. A, then? Hepat what does Kerala get every time? Leptospirosis. Every time Vagis Thomas called me for the exam, then I used to see a lot of patients. Leptospirosis. What did you have the epidemics no, in Leptospirosis? Leptospirosis, dengue fever. No. This, is a, this is not the presentation of uh, leptospirosis no. or dengue no, sir. Leptospirosis and dengue are called as tropical jaundice. How do they present? Fever, myalgia. What is the difference between uh, hepatotropic viral hepatitis and a tropical jaundice? Clinically, how do they present? High grade fever, usually associated with high grade fever. Now, both will have fever. Both will have fever, body pain, they have myalgia, anorexia, weight loss. But in patients with, uh, say, with a tropical jaundice, what will happen with the onset of ictus? Uh, it's uh, in the second week. The patients, the, the, the people with tropical hepatitis or like people who have got tropical jaundice, they will, they will have continued to have fever. Yes. But whereas in patients with viral hepatitis, the fever generally yes. subsides at the onset of ictus. That's the most important thing. Yes, sir. So what is the other hepatitis which we commonly see these days? Hepatitis. hepatitis E. Mm, yes, sir. That's the most important thing which we see. Hepatitis E. No? Yes, sir. So, if at all, if you have viral hepatitis, this could either be a hepatitis B, hepatitis A, a or hepatitis, hepatitis E. 51 year old man comes with jaundice, right upper quadrant pain. Alcoholic hepatitis is another possibility, sir. Alcoholic hepatitis is another possibility. Then. Mm. Cholecystitis with the complications. Cholecystitis, the pain will be pain, very severe. Pain. Which malignancy can start with a mild jaundice and a mild right upper quadrant pain? Uh, gallbladder, gallbladder malignancy, sir. Gallbladder malignancy you see in the north, in the south. Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, hepatocellular carcinoma or Hyla cholangiocarcinoma yes, can come to you with some sort of a right upper quadrant pain. So this will be your uh, thing. So this the it, this, it is it is not uh, with with the, with the lack of fever persisting. You have to think this is not tropical jaundice. You know. Yes. So enumerate the causes of tropical jaundice. What we see. Viral hepatitis A. No tropical jaundice. Tropical. I'm not talking about viral hepatitis. Not non heterotropic. Yeah. Okay, so one is uh, leptospirosis. Leptospirosis, number one. Number two. Dengue fever. Dengue. Number three. CMV and Epstein Barr virus. No. CMV doesn't come with fever. Okay, malaria, no? Malaria. Because in Kerala, you won't see malaria, but many of these other people will see malaria. No? Which malaria will produce jaundice? Falciparum. And? Malaria, malaria can also produce this one. Okay. Number four. Mm 
supposing you have a rash and jaundice hi scrub typhus scrub typhus mm -hmm. no? then rickets Rick, infection sir can amoebic liver abscess produce jaundice can produce huh? can produce, liver produce jaundice yeah Typically, even though it is described that amoebic liver abscess does not produce jaundice, but you can always have jaundice and amoebic, especially in tropics. You have to go back and read Dr. Professor B.S. Anand's article in amoebic amoebiasis, and then amoebic liver abscess can produce jaundice. Then, if you have multiple abscess, Colang what do you call them? Cholangitic abscess. Cholangitic abscess or pyemic abscess. So, these will all be hosted off of jaundice other than Okay, so these will be your differential diagnosis. One year old patient who comes with a right upper quadrant pain and jaundice of one week duration. He did not have any prodrome, he didn't have any features of decompensation, and uh, he has, um, of course, he didn't have any cholestatic symptoms. Okay, neither did he have fever or chills. So this will be your okay. Can we have the next slide? Professor Venkat, can I just uh, ask? Sure, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Anytime, sir, please. <laughs> Dr. Benila, you mentioned the viral hepatitis A as the first diagnosis in a 50 year old male. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you should be very careful when you diagnose viral hepatitis A in elderly persons, especially if you're having exam outside Kerala. Kerala still have uh, viral hepatitis A, still epidemics are there, and it affects elderly also because they have never been exposed to this infection earlier. But by, this, by the time somebody is 50, you would have got some sort of a subclinical infection, subclinical infection. So okay. telling viral hepatitis A in an elderly person, uh, it is a little, little bit difficult to accept. Okay. Yes. Hepatitis E, if you mention, okay, we'll accept. Hepatitis B, okay. And hepatitis A should be low in the list. And if you have exam in a state which is outside Kerala, you must be extremely careful because hepatitis A in adults is practically unknown there. Okay, Mostly it is hepatitis. Yeah. Even, okay. even in viral hepatitis, the commonest cause of ALF is hepatitis B, B. followed by hepatitis E in our country. Yes. So A is years. What is the other difference that diagnosis you will think of in this patient? One is huh? always, always in any jaundice you think of alcoholic hepatitis. No, you have said alcohol, oh. you said viral, you, we said tropical. Then we, we looked at some of these obstructive genres like CA, gallbladder, this thing. What is the other keep on? You should ask the history, which you will not be able to get many times. Just like drug induced, no? Drug induced oh, liver yeah. injury is something which you even think. The patient may not be very forthright to come and tell you that they have been taking drugs unless, unless we tell them. Okay. That's what that you should keep on asking. And you will find at least 16 to 26 percent of patients will never come come forward to tell you that they have been taking drugs. Yesterday I had a 22 year old guy coming with jaundice. Okay, that's not fitting into anything. But you looked at his build. His build was his yeah, upper torso was heavy in this thing. Then we just he goes to gym, and he was taking those protein powders in the gym. I knew these are the one of the things. So you need to keep on asking whether there's this thing. So. In gym, they have a habit of injecting anabolic steroids. Anabolic steroids plus they give some protein powders. Ah, and these protein powders, uh, we have today, we have yeah. just sent it for the analysis. And I've seen quite a few times coming with cholestatic jaundice. It will not be very high. SGOT, SGPT are 60, 70. Alkalis will think you'll have jaundice. So you got to be, so you keep, that's what, uh, in, 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 if you look at the drug induced uh, jaundice, nearly. 16 to 26 percent, they think it's quite normal, especially taking Siddha, homeopathy, Ayurveda. Okay, Precisely. so this is something which you need to think of. So, a very basic discussion I want to do. So, 51 year old comes with one week history of jaundice and right upper quadrant thing. These are things you need to think before you go on a thing. So, you think of viral, you think of sometimes tropical not fitting in, you will think of drug induced, you will think of. Uh, <clears throat> some other uh, probably 51 years we also think of some extra hepatic obstructions in the mild pain. Okay. And, and other parasites, no? like hydactyl, rupture, mm -hmm. system. 
have a wide, wide differential. Should have a wide differential when somebody has come with that. So. Okay, we can move on. Can we move on? Yeah. Family and personal history. No history of GA or liver pathology in the family. Married and two children. No high risk behavior. Sleep disturbed since onset of complaints. Chronic alcohol user consumes around 240 ml of whiskey since last 12 years. Last intake is five days back. Non smoker mixed diet. So, what do you think this is? Mm, he consumes uh, significant amount of alcohol. Mm. So, he consumes significant amount of alcohol. So, what do you call it? What is significant amount of alcohol? Mm, for a. So, mm. when do you suspect? Uh, you think that he has got alcoholic hepatitis? Yes, sir. Why do you say he's got alcoholic hepatitis? Uh, he consumes 240 ml of uh, significant amount of alcohol intake means it is expressed in uh, grams that is more than uh, 60. Now, when do you qualify somebody is having alcoholic liver disease or alcoholic hepatitis? Alcoholic hepatitis, sir, bilirubin sh uh, level should be more than. No, no, no. Here, here. In the historically. Historically, uh, last uh, uh, he is con continues to take alcohol in the more than six months with the abstinence less than sixty days. That is uh, two months. How many and, grams for female? How many drinks uh, for female? How many uh, drinks? Uh, four drinks for male and three drinks for female. Four sir. to six drinks for male and three to four drinks for female. Female, sir. He has to be at least been drinking continuously for six months with an abstinence of less than two months 60 days 60 days so so he fits the criteria so you okay. should know the criteria of certain alcoholic hepatitis okay yes sir or is it probable alcoholic hepatitis definite alcoholic hepatitis so okay. definite alcoholic hepatitis is excessive in the laboratory evidence of this one. plus biopsy sir then you can have probable alcoholic hepatitis and then uh, possible, possible, sir. Possible. possible. Hepatitis. Okay. So, he's been consuming about 240 ml of whiskey since last two years, last intake of five days back. Okay? Yes, sir. So, in this patient, you think he's got the, the, this is a very classical presentation of alcoholic hepatitis? Uh, it can alcoholic it has hepatitis. come only with jaundice and abdominal pain. It has not come with any decompensation. Uh, usually, alcoholic hepatitis presents with anorexia, uh, decreased food intake, fatigue. Then jaundice is can be present there. Then abdominal pain. Predominantly, a, a severe alcoholic hepatitis. Generally, it's an inflammatory syndrome. So they so have some sick, fever. Yeah, usually, usually sick. Inflammatory syndrome, isn't it? They'll yes. be anorectic. They may have fever. They can have tech. Okay, all those things we have to see. So he consumes about. So by definition, I think we can consider he's got significant alcohol use disorder and probably alcohol liver disease, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Can I go to the next slide? Nutritional history: total calorie requirement is two thousand kilocalorie per day, and protein requirement is 80, 80 gram. He consumes thousand six hundred. That is uh, four hundred. Kilocalorie deficient and protein 20 gram deficient. Yeah. Can you go to the next slide? So, can you summarize this? A 51 year old male with uh, significant alcohol intake for the last 12 years presented with yellow uh, uh, discoloration of highs. And right, right upper up quadrant up. pain for the last one week with uh, no features of decompensation except pedal edema. No evidence of prodrome. Prodrome, no pro with no prodromal symptoms. With no features of decompensation. Decompensation, right. yes, sir. Like what? Uh, one what is the dis uh, abdominal distension, hepatic encephalopathy, like altered sensorium or behavior, then GI bleed. GI, yeah, very good. So these are three things which. You have not. So no GI bleed, this thing, and no history of any uh, altered sensorium or sleep. Uh, no history of any hepatic encephalopathy. Cam intake. Mm. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm. These are things. Okay. So 
So what will be a differential diagnosis? First possibility is always um, uh, alcoholic hepatitis in this background. Yeah, one is alcoholic hepatitis. Okay, number two. Then combination of alcoholic plus NASH. Uh, maybe I don't know about the patient okay. habitus and all. Mm -hmm. You may have then, alcoholic hepatitis. And then... It's and superimposed. Then viral hepatitis B and C. You can have alcoholic hepatitis with viral, okay. hepatitis, viral B, hepatitis Or you okay. think you've got some other pathology in the liver. Yes, sir. Can you have cirrhosis? A compensated cirrhosis is possible, sir. Compensated cirrhosis and why this jaundice? Mm. Any, I mean, alcohol, increased alcohol in the, in the last few days or last, precipitated by the... You may have a comp. So one is alcoholic hepatitis. Number two, you said the other thing is alcoholic hepatitis plus NASH. Third is, can you have, can you have had a cirrhosis? It's a compensated cirrhosis with alcoholic hepatitis. You can have compensated cirrhosis, alcoholic hepatitis. They come with features of what? The compensation usually. What is the commonest cause of uh, how do they present? Supposing you have cirrhosis and there is a continuous alcohol and there's alcoholic hepatitis, how do they present? What do you call that condition? ACLF, sir. Tell me correctly, uh, acute on chronic liver failure. Yes, Don't yes, give sir. abbreviations and all that. Uh, uh, sorry, sir. It can be acute on chronic liver failure. Mm -hmm. When somebody comes with acute on chronic thing, alcoholic hepatitis, have you seen with chronic acute on chronic liver failure? Yes, sir. They present with what? Mm -hmm. How do clinically they look? Sick. They look deeply Sick. tricked. Sick. They can have deeply tricked. Or they might be having encephalopathy. And when you look at it, they may have one organ failure. Okay. Yes, sir. One, or one, two, three organ failure. That is, they are a little sick on this. Okay. They can have cirrhosis, but something else also. They can have a superimposed viral hepatitis. Yes. They can have hep B or hep E can also happen in this patient. So that, that's also a possibility in this patient. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Do you get always, do you need always alcoholic hepatitis to progress to cirrhosis in these patients? What is the progression of... No, sir. If, if we stop alcohol at this moment... What, tell me what are all the... What are all, how do the alcohol liver disease progress? Okay, sir. Uh, alcoholic fatty liver is the first change, sir. How many percentage will have alcohol fatty liver? Around 85% of alcoholic 100, 100, cancer. 100, 85 to 100%. Don't tell 85, be correct. 100%. 100%. How many of them will progress to alcoholic hepatitis? 35 20%. 20%. 20%. Or alcoholic hepatitis. How many can progress direct to cirrhosis? 10 to 20. 30 percent. Okay, sir. And in that 30 percent of cirrhosis, if you have alcoholic hepatitis as a trigger for ACLF, 50 percent of them okay. will develop ACLF. Okay? okay. So once you get into cirrhosis, what will be the rate of decompensation per year if you don't stop alcohol? 8 percent. 7 to 8 percent. To 10 percent per year yes sir is hcc common in alcohol liver disease it can occur sir it's more how much common. percentage one to two two to four percent per year or two to seven percent per year it can, can develop it's this will be the progression yes, so sir. this man can have a alcoholic hepatitis he can yes, have sir. alcohol yes. drink at nash or he can have a compensated cirrhosis huh yes sir uh, can this thing compensated cirrhosis with a superimposed B or E in these patients. Yes. Somebody asked some question. Can alcoholic hepatitis be called a decompensated cirrhosis? Yes. You could probably uh, tell there is alcohol hepatitis could be possibly a trigger for his presentation as ACL. That's what we are discussing. So in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, when you continue to drink alcohol, that alcoholic hepatitis will be the single commonest trigger for you are acute on chronic liver failure. So alcohol can come as alcoholic hepatitis. It can come, it can go on to alcoholic hepatitis, hepatitis, hepatitis. Cirrhosis. Alcoholic hepatitis is the single most common cause of producing ACLF in patients with cirrhotic. Mm -hmm. And when you become cirrhotic, you decompensate at 7 to 10 percent per year and develop HCC between 2 to 7 percent per year. Okay? Yes, that is what, that's what we need to think about.
is a question by Rohit. Rohit, what's the question you want? Rohit? You raised your hand, you can just ask the question. Okay, continue. There's some questions in the chat box. Um, okay. Clinical examination. Question is conscious, oriented, ictus present, no pallor, sinus. So, what, what is your proposed definition? Uh, man, man, alcoholic hep hepatitis. Mm. First one. Then, uh, superimposed uh, viral or viral hepatitis or uh, metabolic na NASH. Mm. Then, with jaundice, you know, all are with jaundice, with pain. Mm. Then you see. So HCC is still a possibility, no? HCC? Yes. And yes. HCC is still a regular alcohol, NASH, it's possible. Yes. Maybe associated viruses there, we do not know. Yes. And HCC will come, because especially there when you, when you have HCC rapidly coming up on alcohol liver disease, most of the times it may be coexistent with a NASH or a hep B or a hep C. C. Among hep B and hep C, which is more common in alcohol liver disease? Hepatitis B, sir. Hep C. Hep C. Okay. Can we consider cholidocolithiasis? Cholidocolithiasis in a patient 51 years generally tends to come with come with fever, cholangitis, cholangitis. Mostly in elderly patient only, 10% of the patients with cholidocolithiasis can come with painless joints. Generally in this age group, they come with severe pain and the pain is, uh, is associated with fever and chills. Okay? Severe pain. Okay. Can it be a uh, venoclusive disease, central highline sclerosis? What will be the presentation? As a uh, ascites. Yeah, they can have a large liver, tender liver, ascites, they will be more toxic and sick. No? Yes. The, ways, the case is being described, the patient doesn't seem to be toxic. No? Yes, ma'am. Description doesn't seem as though it's toxic. Is it is it possible that the patient's got some secondaries in the liver? Jaundice and uh, jaundice yes, and pain? Yes, because yes, this is between jaundice and pain, but maybe there is a secondary. Malignant infiltration. Yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma secondaries can present. Yeah. Lymphoma. Lymphoma. Can, uh, yes, but Chiari syndrome can be a differential. But Chiari syndrome can be differential for any chronic liver disease. But they, this, if at all they present, they have to present with an acute but Chiari. And they have some pain. Then they come, initially they come with ascites also. Okay, so only the chronic but Chiari they present as a chronic liver disease. By the time they have a lot of collateral, so they do not decompensate. They decompensate. If there is a superimposed viral hepatitis, superimposed malignancy, or there is an extension of thrombosis into some of these hepatitis. So this is what happens in this. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, conscious or needed, it's present, no pallor, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or pedal edema, bilateral parotid swelling present, no other stigmata of uh, CLD, vital stable, parabdomen soft, Right to hypochondria. That means there are no, there, there were a lot of spiders in this patient. Okay, sir. And there was no history of, uh, there was no ascites, there was no, uh, there was a mild parotid and uh, bilateral parotid thing, thing, but there was, there were spiders. Yes. Yeah, his vitals were stable. He had a mild pedal edema. Okay, go ahead. Liver felt 4 cm below costal margin, firm in consistency, spleen palpable 7 cm below costal margin, minimal free fluid present. No dilated pains. Okay. So what do you say this? Uh, he's got he's a firm hepatomegaly uh, hepato with the splenomegaly with the minimal ascites. No dilating. There is no, no flapping. Yeah. Other systems normal. What other systems you look for? So the presence of splenomegaly is a large and the large liver, tender yes, liver. Yes, sir. Does it say it's only alcoholic hepatitis or does you think... What the... are your differentials now? Jaundice, Especially with the speed, 
chronic liver disease. Can it be storage disorder? There are no veins. Any storage disorder? Infiltrative disorders. What storage disorders? Infiltration is not storage. No? Uh, Gauchas, this is glycogen storage disease. Gauchas at age of 51. Less likely. No? Mm -hmm. Which are the other storage disorders? They have heptospinal, like late 51 year old. Yes. Hypogonadism, alcohol, diabetes. Um, um, uh, hemochromatosis. Hemochromatosis also should come in your BD, you know? especially the pain. Yes. They can be predisposed to HCC. Yes. See, after examination, I would again think, you know, whether could it be again that blood differential for hemochromatosis? So this is what is spleen palpable and, and portal hypertension. Yes. Spleen palpable, you need to think of one diseases may be due to portal hypertension. No? So that yes. means this patient that had a chronic liver disease, yes. got a portal hypertension, and basically what has happened is continued okay. abuse of alcohol produced an acute yes. alcoholic hepatitis okay. or a pre-existing. As Madam said, he may have an alcohol liver disease, but since there's a large, there's a spleen which is about seven centimeters mm -hmm. below the costal margin, he may have other diseases, isn't it? You need yes. to think of some infiltrative disease. Can it be a lymphoma? It could be a lymphoma. Possibly. It could be a sarcoid. It could be... So the, the message is this. Once you find that, in fact, mm -hmm. what I would do, in fact, as you take the history, examine the patient. No? Then you get the septal screen. And maybe you can see that you've not missed on the nodes, sternal tenderness. Just go backward, you know, and just see that you've done the complete examination. Fever, okay. all that. You should just, just, get by. just go back to diagnose for hyperpigmentation. You know, when it's a hepatosplen or maybe the alcohol, what I as a quick way of examination, what I would do is actually, as I'm asking the history, I place my hand on the abdomen and start examining. So once you find this you know, cytis and the hepatosplen or maybe with no veins, then you start just thinking, okay, what what else should be my differential? But don't appropriate the history to the findings. Just try to put in with the history. Okay. But in the examination, just see that you've done everything that could include the heptospin maybe. That is most important. Nodes, sternal tenderness, echimotic patches, hyperpigmentation, hypogonadism, polycythemia. These are the things that you would look for. Okay. So what does somebody said uh, alcoholic hepatitis can also cause portal hypertension? Yes, it, it does cause, but it does not produce such a big spleen, you know. Yes. If the spleen is present, that means there was a pre-existing chronic liver disease, a possibility, or there's anything else. So the pre chronic liver disease could be due to fibrosis, cirrhosis of alcohol. It could be due to cirrhosis. We also thought of compensated cirrhosis due to B and C, or is it vascular? Does he have a underlying chronic bacteria which has now become? So that's how we think about it. Extra hepatic, you need to think of because the spleen is slightly bigger. Does he have any other? Alicia, a liver disease like uh, any other infiltrated liver disease like this. NCBH is not a possibility. It does not present like this at all. Okay. So, in the history of significant alcohol. So, there was a spleen which was 7 centimeters. That's what we did. The, the person who's asked NCPF, what was in your mind? Can you just come forward and say, you cannot just you know, ask questions? Like, I mean, try, try, just try to analyze why you asked the Why question. did you say NCPF? Why, why, just why, because did you raise, yeah, why did you raise the question of NCPF? Whoever spoke to you, I don't know, I don't know who asked it. Can you just come forward and um, speak out, please? The person who asked the question for NCPF, why did you consider NCPF in this patient at all? Please come, it's an interactive session. So just come forward so that we know what mistakes you make or where, would you ever consider this question? Yes, Gita. We can't hear you. Hello, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Why, no, why was NCPS considered in this? Place? Why did it come to your mind, NCPS? Ma'am, in the presence of phenomegaly, with the no cirrhosis, a liver, liver normal echo, so you can suspect NCPS, ma'am, in middle age. No, liver is firm and consistent. It's clean as well. Liver is felt because even alcohol liver disease can produce a large liver. NCPH will tend to come much earlier. They don't present with jaundice. They generally tend to have large spleen and patient will have been complaining of some left upper quadrant discomfort pain for a long time. Recurrent GI bleed. What is this thing? Dr. Yeah, NCPF. Age of presentation. NCPF presenting with jaundice is very unlikely. Unlikely. That's right. It's not, it's, it's not standard presentation. No, no, unless you have portal bigopathy. Yeah, that is flag end of the. I can do it by the time you would have bled once or twice, you would have yeah. seen you.
okay other systems are normal which other systems you look for in these patients some people are very very fond in alcohol liver disease what are the other systems will get can get get affected so one is higher mental functions is very 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 you'll always be looking out for this finding no mainly neurology one is neurology sir the patient the restlessness he will ask you this question i'm asking you what question aspiration pneumonia patient has unconsciousness and no alcohol he never had any altered sensorium he never had anything so somebody with alcohol one exam is very particular he will be he will be waiting for you whether you have said that or not alcoholic cardiomyopathy exactly alcoholic cardiomyopathy so he will ask you what is the size of the heart so be careful there are some examiners who want have you look for a cardiomyopathy then they'll keep checking on your cardiopathy is the jvp elevated is there a cardiomyopathy is there a s3 okay lv s3 okay all the so be careful you look for that so yeah some people are very concerned about the nutrition very concerned about the fine especially in alcohol nutrition, nutrition. So, they will look for uh, speeches of uh, muscle loss and frailty okay. test they last score then some people are very concerned about uh, peripheral neuropathy and neuropathy. loss of posterior column sensations they yes. may ask you whether you have asked for the symptoms and ask uh, look at yeah, you look during for, a physical yeah. examination so what are the neurological examination will you look, look for in patients with alcohol limit is alcohol one is higher mental function sir for any hallucination delusions cause of course psychosis or one case in the telepathy like that then uh, peripheral sensations reflexes posterior you column sensation the peripheral neuropathy then you uh, posterior column what else you look for uh, posterior column subacute command for posterior column sensations then uh, then can they uh, develop uh, ataxia yes sir what ataxia cerebral cerebellar ataxia can occur what is it is a gait ataxia or stans ataxia okay stans ataxia stans Oh no, sorry, gait ataxia. Stans ataxia is vermis. Yes, if you have a paleocerebral environment, it will be gait ataxia. Some yes. people are very, very fond of all these things. Okay, so look for a posterior column. Look for peripheral neuropathy. Sarcopenia. Yes, sarcopenia. Yeah. Alcoholic myopathy. Yes. Is it tender, non-tender? Non-tender. Tender, tender myopathy. So all these you should know in alcohol liver disease. And you give an alcohol liver disease. these are things which you are expected you are expected they are they look for okay is more than aspiration for the lung what will you look for what are the two chronic infections alcohol liver, alcohol patients alcohol can develop in the lung tuberculosis number 2 Clepsilomonas. Sure, Aspergillosis. Asper. Okay. Aspergillosis. It is important these days that you look for aspergillosis in patients with alcohol liver disease, because you need to rule out all these things before you start them on treatment. So yes, tuberculosis. Sir. In our country, you need tuberculosis and aspergillosis. In the West, yes, most of the time they look for aspergillosis. Yes, okay. Yes, sir. Right. So these are things you should know. Look for in patients with alcohol liver disease. And always mention about the CASE criteria, audit CASE scoring, audit, okay. all, all that, all that. Yeah, yeah correct. You what happens? You have to, you have to mention that. Audit C and CASE. All, all this will come in your summary. Summaries okay. and in your syndromic diagnosis, you have to bring that because then they will ask you what is dependence, what is intoxication, what is addiction. All those questions will be asked. And there are recent changes in that entire um, discipline. Use the word alcohol use disorder. So, so nobody should be asked alcoholic. So you yeah. should know the definition of alcoholic use disorder. What is yeah. alcohol intoxication? Define a binge drinking. If uh, it's uh, six drinks for male, five drinks for male and four drinks for females, that is in, in how many hours? In two hours. And that increases the blood level of alcohol to point zero eight percentage. Okay, and always do a mental examination on all these patients, yes. and you should look for predominantly on the cognitive skills. Yes. So this is what you should do in alcohol liver disease. Okay, yes, and, and, alcohol and, liver disease. This will be an extensive uh, assessment of your knowledge about alcohol. Okay.
Okay. So if, if there is a flat, then don't look for the number connection test and all that. But if there is no flat, you have to do millimental scoring. MMS is very important. And uh, if there is a flap, of course, you don't do any of the other coordination tests. But if there is none, then you have to get look for, ask him to sign with a micrographia. And the number connection test is always uh, comparing with the same literacy status. You must know all this. Okay. Some of the hospitals have in their ward the retail trade test. They have the number connection test. Then you know, you must know what is FCTA and what is FCTB figure connection test. All these are part of the examination. Okay. A quick cursory examination of a patient who is consuming alcohol. Okay. Okay. okay uh, next time. So, what's your diagnosis now? Give a differential so that we can investigate. Mm, quick, one quick, one, two, three, four, five. One possibility is alcoholic hepatitis, supraadrenal chronic liver disease with water hypertension. You know what alcohol associated hepatitis? Yes, no? yes. Alcohol it's associated hepatitis, supraadrenal mm. chronic alcohol associated chronic liver disease with water hypertension. You know, the so, call it is advanced chronic liver disease, complex with clinical significant for the recent changes in the terminology. Would you like to use some of those terminologies? Compensated. Advanced chronic liver disease with clinical significant for hypertension. Compensated. Please read the Bevino, no? The okay, latest Bevino. Okay, okay. There's a changing terminology, subclinical and clinically significant. So, one you think is alcohol associated hepatitis? As po uh, possibilities uh, infiltrated. Yeah, just, 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 just keep the screen, you know, it's a massive screen with no waves, no minimal pre plus minus. Mm -hmm. Chemochromatosis is a possibility. Chemochromatosis, yes. Then, number three. Uh, then. Infiltrate lymphomas, Infiltrate lymphomas. lymphomas, myelofibrosis. What will be the presentation of myelofibrosis? You're not La, massive splenomegaly, ma'am. You think you think is it a splenohepatomegaly or hepatosplenomegaly? Splenohepatomegaly. Ah, so now what's the differentiation for a splenohepatomegaly? They'll all be hematological. Last will be non-serotic intraparic hypertension. Yes. They'll all be hematological. MPN, myelofibrosis, yes. all these in that. Then liver is also involved. Then NPN, myelofibrosis will also come top in the list. So you ask me to fatigue, exhaustion, tiredness. In the history, that will come forward. No? Alcohol may just be a red herring and it's just giving you away. Supposing when they give the results and they say that platelet count is 2.5, you know, then you already consider the possibility in your differentials. So you so those are the differentials: malaria, kala azar. So start with have a classification infection. Anything in inflammation, then you have the um, uh, infection inflammation, then you have the storage disorders, then you have the um, uh, neoplastic disorders, have a way of classifying, and then miscellaneous causes. Okay. 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 The, these are the things that you consider. You know, if, if once there's a splenohepatomegaly, then the differentials will be hovering around the hematological, that is one dictum. And, and the jaundice may just be a red herring. It's just giving you that alcohol bit and taking you away from the diagnosis, which could be totally different. So alcohol related and non-alcohol related have that classification. You won't go wrong then. Okay. Okay. So now, so shortly, so what is infiltrative? Hematological, what are your differentials? Hematological? Lymphomas. What lymphoma? Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, ma'am. Lymphoma then? Any other? Then myelofibrosis. Myelofibrosis, yes. Then? What about polycythemia? Rubra, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Polycythemia, you can have a massive spleen. What about hairy cell leukemia? They're all the causes. Amylo amyloidosis. Amyloidosis is again infiltrated. You can have a large spleen and you can have a hectosplenomegaly. Yes. So, actually, it is this case is actually discussion of a splenohepatomegaly with jaundice. You know? So, okay. you can hover around that. And in the liver, I think I'll not consider anything beyond that other than hemochromatosis on this side and uh, maybe alcohol associated hepatitis. But I explain will never be this large. It'll never be this large. Okay. okay, can we move on to the next discussant for the investigations? LBK? Yeah, madam. Now, VT, differentials, order? Yeah, I think that liver disease uh, because of the spleen which is uh, fairly mm -hmm. significant we cannot put uh, liver disease as the first thing in this yeah, exactly. that's one issue that's the one issue so okay. the exam after 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 you done the examination you can mention that uh, i would like to give a differential for a splenohepatomegaly this is how sarasun discusses you know 
hepatoplenomegaly and splenomegaly or splenohepatomegaly or hepatosplenomegaly then, then both are almost almost the same size okay 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 so what's the investigations you want to complete him uh, hemoglobin uh, hemogram uh, look for pan sinopenia as in hypersplenism project can take over and then you can come yes, back yes. to management yeah yes yes sir. can you have the next slide uh, so uh, so lab parameters cbc read hemoglobin is 11.8 mcv uh, is 104 uh, increase it uh, uh, total count is thousand. Uh, Differential are neutrophil sixty-eight, ten four seventy, uh, and platelets are three lakh three hundred. INR is one point seven. Uh, Personal dose macrocytic normochromic. Uh, so he had an elevated MCV. Yes. Yeah. But uh, he has got hemoglobin eleven point eight. Total count was twelve thousand. LFT shows that's well generally preserved. No? Why is the MCV uh, so elevated? Uh, patient has been uh, as uh, there is a uh, significant history of alcohol intake. No, why is the MCV elevated? Can alcohol liver disease have elevated MCV? They can have macrocytosis, isn't it? They can have macrocytosis. So Anjali, your audio is not clear. Anjali, improve your audio. We can't hear you. Please speak. Macrocytosis can be caused due to folate deficiency in these patients. Okay. So they can have macrocytosis. Can you hear me, Dr. Majid? Yes, yes, sir. I can hear. So one is macrocytosis, his counts were uh, 12,000. So what are the usual, what are the usual total counts in alcoholic hepatitis? Usually uh, it will be leukocytosis. It could be leukocytosis. So in alcohol liver disease, alcoholic hepatitis, if you have leukocytosis, what are the possibilities? Possibility of uh, either it can be first secondary to uh, syndrome of alpha hepatitis or uh, there will be coexisting uh, infection. Infection. So, how do you differentiate whether this is due to infection or due to alcoholic hepatitis? Uh, we can uh, look for a CD or uh, CBC as well as uh, pro calcitonin. Which is better, procalcitonin or CRP? Can you do CRP for this? Uh, CRP is uh, will be easily available and cheaper, so it will go first. With no, CRP. but in studies which are shown to be better, better sensitivity okay. to detect infections in alcoholic okay. liver, alcoholic Pro hepatitis. Procalcitonin. Procalcitonin is something. It does not. It's not very, uh, CRP is not very sensitive to find out about infection and alcohol liver disease. Okay. So what do you expect in LFT, in alcohol liver disease? Uh, there should no, before be, uh, you look at it, what will, what will be the LFT yes. liver function uh, parameters? Yes. What will be the, the liver liver parameters? What do you expect the liver parameters to be? Uh, there will be uh, hyperbilirubinemia, but not that significant if it is not... Uh, severe acute alcoholic hepatitis and uh, uh, AST ALT will be raised with the AST. Till, ALT till what ALT, level did they go up? They will not go beyond usually 400, less than 400. Yeah, less than five. And Generally, it's above 50, but less than 500. Yes, sir. And it will be AST ALT 2 is to 1 ratio and uh, albumin will be low. So, here what albumin is. So here total bilirubin is twenty one, direct is nineteen. What happens? Uh, what happens to SGOT and SGPT in alcohol liver disease? Uh, it will. Uh, there will be two is to one ratio. But AST, AST Which is more is in alcohol liver disease? AST is more than AST. 
the AST is more than the ALT, then, then this thing. Okay. So here you have a bilirubin of 21. You have SGOT more than SGPT. Albumin is low. Surprisingly, alkaline phosphate is normal, but gamma GT was elevated. And his prothrombin time was prolonged. So he's got AG reversal. He's got elevated bilirubin, prolonged prothrombin time, and increased gamma GT. Okay? okay uh, gamma GT is one of the markers, although no specific for alcoholic liver disease. Oh. Indicate that monocyte 14% is normal. Lymphocyte 17, M14. Yeah, madam. Up to what is normal? I don't remember. Up to 6 is normal. Man. Up to 2 uh, two to 4 is normal, man. Huh, so this is 14, no? Yeah, it was 14, man. Mm. So, any comments on that, Majid? Uh, monocytosis. Mm. Can be some viral infection. Especially uh, uh, mononucleosis. Infected mononucleosis. Any, any viral can go up, can, can produce this. Okay monocytosis so probably this uh, this can be consistent with alcoholic hepatitis or he may have alcohol hepatitis superimposed on a chronic liver disease okay yes sir. can you yeah Move on. Uh, what else you want that, after that uh, we would like to do uh, RFT renal function test uh, to look for uh, creatinine, uh, urea is 27, creatinine is 0.8, uh, sodium is lower 129, potassium is 3.9, it's normal, and uh, bicarb is 18.5, uh, and uh, calcium. So there was no. Yes. So what do you say on this? So uh, there is a hyponatremia. Uh, Mild hyponatremia, okay. Natremia. What is uh, more relevant in this? And uh, urea is, is slightly higher. urea is normal. No, normal, yes. Sir. Creatinine is 0 0.8. Is this important to have a baseline of this urea and creatinine in this patient? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, because uh, uh, knowing the creatinine being normal is a uh, better sign compared to uh, present, presenting with acute kidney injury. That uh, it means it is important that you have a baseline so that if you want to look for acute kidney injury, you need to have a baseline urea and creatinine, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. And then uh, we can uh, if, if present prognosticate also the patient uh, on the uh, admission. So all of you know the definition of AKI in a chronic liver disease, isn't it? Why is it 0 0.8 is important here? After two days, it becomes 1.1. You think he's got AKI? No AKI. Uh, he has got AKI. More Why? than 0 0.3, more than increase. 0 0.3, 0 .3, yeah. So all of you should know the definition of AKI in a setting of chronic liver disease and predict to this one. Okay. What else you want on this? Uh, second, would like to do an ultrasound abdomen with Doppler. Ultrasound abdomen, uh, he got it from elsewhere. Uh, it was, it showed hepatomegaly, cord, a cordate lobe. I think before that, before that, what are the other tests that you other do? Things? Metrological. For the etiology workup, no? Yeah, yes, ma'am. So you need a good reference smear, you need a good reference smear, so because this is splenohepatomegaly. Yeah. What was the platelet count? 3 lakhs. They were 3 lakhs 16 dollars. Ah, so 3 lakhs 16 So what's your interpretation? Are you still dealing with a chronic liver disease? Uh, Just keep that in mind. See that monocyte was shifting somewhere. Then there's a yeah, yeah. platelet count which is high. What was the hemoglobin? What was the hemoglobin? 11.8. 11.8. So are we dealing with a primary chronic liver disease or non-liver disease? This gives you a clue, no? Yes, ma'am. It, it, it is now shifting non to a non liver, no? except for the jaundice. So, so now it is a jaundice with a probably some other disorder which is likely to be non liver. 
Yes. Keep that in. So, what are the investigation? We've discussed so many different issues. What What are the important tests that you would do for the Chuka uh, Jiva Cup? And gamma DTs elevate, alphas is normal. So, infiltrated disorders are almost not there. What test would you do for myelofibrosis? What test would you do for hemochromatosis? What would you ask we for myelo? Yeah, myelo. Yeah. Yeah, we would uh, like to do iron profile of the patient. Iron profile, iron. absolutely. I will definitely ask for an iron profile. <coughs> what What would you ask in iron profile? Uh, uh, serum uh, transparent saturation. No, how, how do you calculate uh, the transparent saturation? How do you calculate the transparent saturation? Iron by iron by link capacity. So what do you need? Iron by iron by serum iron. Iron, that's all. So what that's you need? Iron think. by iron by link capacity into 100 will be the transparent saturation. That is important. Somebody is consuming so much of alcohol. What do you expect the ferritin to be? And ferritin will be elevated. Ferritin will be high, elevated. Yeah. Yeah. So, we want to look at the viral markers. And viral markers. Yeah. Most importantly, we want to look at the viral markers, isn't it? And macrocytic anemia, so folic acid, B12, all this should come out spontaneously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, do you have the viral like markers in the report? Sir? HIV, HCS, AG, anti uh, were negative and uh, anti uh, HIV, IgM was negative. HCV, IgM was positive. And uh, SI6 fluid analysis, uh, total. No, no, just, no, no, just stop it. Just don't go this thing. Here, look at this HIV, HBS, AG, HCV is negative. HAV is negative. HCV is positive. So now you talk yes, about so that. Now you give us a thing. HEV IgM is positive here in this patient. So, so this, this man has come with jaundice. He's got severe alcohol intake. He has got jaundice. He has got mild ascites. He's got a spleen. How is the how is the HEV IgM correlating with the transaminases? Uh, it's not that much correlating. Yeah, exactly. So there is maybe it is settling. No, it's possible. Yeah. Because that's only the otherwise we are expected in thousands, no? So what is the importance of hepatitis E positive in this patient? Oh, whether it is false positive also we have to keep that in mind. No, somebody has got already a chronic liver disease or alk hepatitis, if he's got a hepatitis E positive, instead of thinking as first false positive, what is what is it what is it you should be another, careful about? No? Another possibility, uh, no, no. What is the impact of hepatitis E in a patient who's got either chronic liver disease or a patient who's got severe alcoholic hepatitis? Can you can you have a chronic HEV? Yeah, yes, yes, one possibility. And reactivation. This has been described in post transplant patients, but I would not know about this. So, so in this patient with a severe alcoholic hepatitis, we say. We have made a diagnosis of alcoholic hepatitis. We made a diagnosis of possible chronic liver disease. Hepatitis E is positive. So what is the impact of hepatitis as E a, in a patient with chronic? What all it can do? Like, tell me. Uh, Suppose uh, somebody is cirrhotic and have, have everything. Yeah, the patient can, it can cause decompensation and uh, uh, it can as well present with acute and chronic liver failure. Yeah. So they can develop ACLF. Patient can uh, can can also have a decompensation, no? Yes, sir. And pay, can, pay, pay, can patient have an increased mortality? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you should tell me all these things, okay? I can't be asking you, will they have a mortality? If you look at hepatitis E in a patient like this in your rounds, then there are things which will tell you that this patient may have uh, this thing. If there is an alcoholic hepatitis in this patient with a hepatitis E positive, there will be increased mortality. Problems in treating him, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. Because, uh, okay. So, HM, the HB is AG and anti HCV are negative. One test is missing here. So, uh, anti HCV IgG also we would like to. Total anti HBC should be done. Should be done. And, uh, and uh, if that's positive, that's reactive, what do you do? Uh, IgG also we should look uh, whether it is reactive. No, no. If somebody if it is or if supposing he is anti-total HbG is reactive. Supposing his HbC is reactive, total anti-HbG is reactive. What does it suggest to you? Uh, yes, uh, 
you might have an occult infection. hepatitis B infection. Yeah. So how yeah. do you how do you confirm that? So HBS uh, you can do the DNA is level. Like a negative doctor an occult infection. So how do you confirm an occult infection? We'll check the uh, DNA, HBV, DNA level. Correct. HBV, DNA, viral load. Good. HBV, DNA, viral load. Right. Okay. Uh, so. Then, uh, hmm. then uh, aesthetic fluid analysis was uh, performed. The total protein was 2. Albumin 1.4. Total counts were 450. With uh, neutrals of 80%. So, he was having SBP. So, he had possibly SBP. SBP. Then, can you go to the previous slide? Is procalcitonin uh, yes. work up? Procalcitonin work up. Yes, sir. Vitamin B12 is 130. Indicate we move forward so yeah. that they come to the management. Yeah, come. Go to the next slide. His ultrasound, let me tell you, before his ultrasound, he got an ultrasound done, which showed mild uh, coarsening of the liver, so mild surface nodularity. The caudate lobe was uh, enlarged and there was a dilated portal vein with mild ascites. That's what he has come with. So we went ahead and did a SCT. Can we have the report of the CT? Uh, CT SCT abdomen is one moderate hepatomegaly with fatty infiltration and loss of cordial flow, prominent protosystemic collateral, uh, cholelithiasis, uh, moderate splenomegaly. Hmm. So, so he's possibly had a chronic liver disease, liver disease. with, with moderate, moderate uh, with collateral formation, portal hypertension, with autosystemic uh, collaterals for the moderate liver. That means he's got underlying chronic liver disease with a superimposed possible alcoholic hepatitis, and there is also a concomitant HEV hepatitis. infection. Okay. Yes, sir. And his hepatitis B C negative. Echo was quite. Good. There was no cardiomyopathy. Uh, no, no cardiomyopathy. Okay. So this is your diagnosis. So he had a probably a chronic liver disease, probably ethanol related, and he had uh, he continued to absorb alcohol. So he has definite clinical and biochemical criteria for acute alcoholic hepatitis. Possibly came with ACLF because he had ascites. No, this one. There was no encephalopathy. No real, no AKI, but he had mild SBP and a superimposed hepatitis T e infection. Mm -hmm. okay. so, how, will you, how will you manage this patient? Now, uh, somebody else is going to take the management or you're going to continue, Dr. Majid? Both of them. Who's anyone third person? So let's go back to Dr. Uh, Binilla. Yes, sir. Tell me the outline of your management in this patient. Uh, first is uh, nutritional management of this patient, then treat the infection. SBP. Nutritional management of alcohol liver disease. Okay. What is the nutritional? Uh, no, first thing I want to know is, uh, okay. Some questions I want to pose to you, right? So should we do a biopsy in this patient? No, not indicated, sir. So when will when will be the biopsy indicated? If there is when a diagnostic the dilemma, no, we want indication of biopsy. Majid, do you would like to do biopsy in this patient for management? Uh, no, ma'am. Why? Because uh, why? Unlikely because we have a, a, a known history of alcoholic hepatitis as well as a viral infection, so we don't have dilemma of diagnosis. Yeah, but what's, what's, your, what's your diagnosis after this? Is it fatty infection? It's more like a steroid hepatitis. So you're going to do a steroid, you're not going to do a steroid. What is your line of management based on that? Would you like to do a liver biopsy? So here, uh, the thing is, uh, it is not, sorry, before you come to uh, decide on a liver biopsy, 
in alcoholic hepatitis what is the so you need to define whether it fits in with definite alcoholic hepatitis does it fit in with pro probable alcoholic hepatitis or possible alcoholic hepatitis dr binila tell me what is definite alcoholic hepatitis what is probable alcohol hepatitis what is possible alcoholic hepatitis definite means uh, clinical plus lab plus biopsy sir you don't do definitely you don't do biopsy definitely you don't do biopsy definite uh, what is definite uh, what is a definite uh, when do you say a patient has got a definite alcoholic hepatitis clinical and lab parameters are correlating and ruled out as other no, causes historically are... as you said definite is clinical criteria that means alcohol use in excess of 60 grams or 40 grams per day for more than 5 years Yes. Continues for six months with abstinence less than eight weeks. Two. That's the clinical criteria. Yes. If you have a bilirubinum more than what, three, three, if your and liver enzymes are more than fifty, less than five hundred, and your prothrombin time is more than one point five, mm -hmm. then you're fine. You can think of definite age. Probable is you have certain features of alcohol liver disease, but at the same time, patient is positive for virus. So, so this could be possible hepatitis E or FB or Hep C or something. Okay. Yes, sir. Possible is a patient with alcoholic hepatitis is recently confounded with a GI okay. bleed or an encephalopathy or atypical a AST ALT pattern. All these okay. things are there. Then you think of a possible, possible age. No? Then only then. In possible age, yes, you go for a liver biopsy. In probable, you may or may not. But if you have a definite age, you don't do a liver biopsy. Yes. In this patient, do you think we should do a liver biopsy? Platelet count is normal. So the platelet count is normal, normal here. Yes, it is not fitting, That's you know, it is not fitting. Not looking classical, uh, definitely. Alcohol. You've got a spleen, moderate splenomegaly, both clinically as well as by the CT guided. But photos is like collaterals, but you don't have uh, viruses here. Okay. So probably in this case, we went ahead and had a, a liver biopsy. I would even consider bone marrow study because because the, the platelet count is more. I asked the hematologist opinion even before I consider liver biopsy. So in alcohol liver disease, liver biopsy, which route? Transduglas, sir, in this patient because Always. and in this patient he is having ascites, so only transduglas, sir. Ascites, PTINR was one point seven, okay. even though the platelets were normal. So we do a transduglas yes, biopsy. Liver biopsy. So when you do transjugular liver biopsy, what are things you measure? HVP. Huh? Tell me, how do you derive at HVPG? Hmm. When you put in yeah. a, when you put in it, what do you first? You go and wedge it and you take the hepatic yeah. wedge pressure. Pressure. Then you bring back, occlude the balloon and pressure. Look for the what pressure? Free hepatic vein pressure. Yes, sir. And have a hepatic wedge pressure gradient is more than? If it's uh, more than 12, it's a no. chronic liver disease. No, uh, no, no. Uh, no. Oh. So more than uh, up to 5, it's normal. More no. than 5, it's up to Anything five. above 6 is portal hypertension. At 10, you develop viruses. At 12, you can have bleed. Mm. Okay? Yes, sir. So HPBG was 18 here. And can you go through and what is the complications of what will be the percentage of complication in a transjugular liver biopsy? Can be local site complications like uh, accidental the percentage 10, 20, 30, 40. Not sure, sir. Less than 10 percent. What is the usual mortality with liver biopsy? No. Should know all these things, but Transjugular, it is about 0.09 percent. With other liver biopsy, it may be anyway two to three percent. So, can you read this? Yes, uh, liver biopsy specimen gross features grossed by uh, received nine linear fragments of greenish tissue measuring 0.1 into uh, 0 0.1. So, you see a liver tissue with distorted architecture due to. Extensive yeah. portal to portal bridging fibros, areas of scarring. What does it say? Uh, uh, fibrosis grains, 
fibrosis. No, what does it say? There is a portal to portal bridging for the areas of scarring. So that means is it cirrhotic, not cirrhotic. Cirrhotic, sir. Bridging fibrosis. For severe there. fibrosis at the same time. That's exactly probably will explain your splenomegalian portal indra mm, collateral, sir. Okay. Why okay. You read it up. I'll ask you questions. Many of the hepatocytes appear swollen. There is marked steatosis. Cellular and canalicular cholestasis are noted. Pericellular fibrosis with the polymorphonuclear infiltrates and numerous malary bodies are observed. Portal areas show ductular reaction and lymphocytic infiltration in addition to fibrosis. So the hepatocytes appear swollen. Okay. Yes, sir. So the appear as well thing, what is it? What is it you'll ask the pathologist? Um, you want to see something else in alcohol liver disease? Steatosis, ballooning degeneration, sir. No, no, no. Inside a hepatocyte zone. Well, Supposing you have an electronic microscope. You have to look for a mega mitochondria. Mega mitochondria. If you have a mega mitochondria, it is a poor prognostic sign. Yes, sir. Marked steatosis. Yes, sir. What does it suggest? Mm, the... So the portal to product bridging fibers, areas of scarring, such as the patient has got cirrhosis. Yes, so sir. swollen hepatocyte, steatosis, molecular polystasis, pericellular fibrosis with polynuclear infiltrates and numerous malary bodies are observed. Steatohepatitis, sir. Hey, peri polymorph nuclear thing, numerous malaria bodies. What does it suggest? Alcoholic hepatitis. Yeah, should I have got alcoholic, alcoholic hepatitis. hepatitis. At the same time, so there is cirrhosis, there is also cholestasis, and there is pericellular fibrosis. Yes. And numerous polymer infiltrates and malaria bodies. What does it suggest? These are features of. Both alcoholic hepatitis with fibrosis, sir. So oh, tell yeah. me, so, so cellular and conalicular cholestasis, there is polymorph and nuclear infiltrates. Tell me the significance of each of this. So if you see a cellular and canalicular cholestasis with bilirubin inside. Bilirubinostasis is a feature of alcohol. So how do you, on based on histology, how do you say this patient has got a good prognosis or a bad prognosis? So you should learn about Meta. what is alcoholic hepatitis histological scoring, scoring system. Rates. So the presence of mecha mitochondria, bad, bad prognosis. Presence of bilirubin cholestasis, bad prognosis. Then your polymorphia nuclear infiltrates and numerous mammary bodies. They're all such things. So now you have what is called as malary body mm. dink scoring. Mm. So yes. you have to look at the number of malary body uh, malary bodies uh, dink cells, and you can you can prognosticate on that. Okay. Yes, sir. It's called the MBD scoring, right? MBD scoring. If you see a lot of polynuclear infiltrates. In a liver biopsy, what does this patient has a risk? If you have a very high polymorphic infiltrates, or if you have a low infiltrates, what are the risks the patient has? If you have a very high polymorphic infiltrates, the risk of infection is high in these patients. Supposing your patients do not have a polymorphic infiltrates, the mortality is high in these patients. Okay. Oh, and uh, look at this. What does this suggest? Pericellular fibrosis. Uh, cirrhosis, sir. The pericellular fibrosis along the hepatic veins, isn't it? Yes. It is called the chicken wire appearance. Mm. So, whenever you have a pericellular pouring hepatic veins, for a given portal hypertension, alcoholic liver disease has got a much higher portal hypertension because there is portal to modern bridging fibrosis at the same time. There is an element of post sinusoidal thing of pericellular fibrosis due to hepatic vein sclerosis, isn't it? That's why these patients tend to become with a much bigger 
spleen sometimes. So he has got alcoholic hepatitis, he has got cirrhosis, but most important feature is that predominantly it is alcoholic hepatitis, okay. which is severe. Yes. Isn't it? Yes, sir. If you look at his uh, Madley's discriminant function, Small, anyway, it's more than 32, sir. I'll say more than 32. Bill Rubin was 21. 21, and INR is 1.7. You don't say INR. PT so value is not. Uh, this thing was 19. Is uh, This thing was 20 and 19, and is this thing was 7. Uh, his uh, 1.13 was the normal. His uh, patience was 19. 14. 5 into 4.6. Tell me, how do you calculate? 4.6 into patient PT minus uh, control PT plus serum bell rubin, sir. Hmm. So, around 20 plus 21. 41, yes. 42. Around. 42. MDF is high. And his mel will be? Okay, say so that that's his mel is 22. He's already bill rubin is 21. So, mel will be more than 22. More, yeah. So one of the things. So it's okay. Severe alcohol hepatitis. Yeah. So there are two prognostic markers. So one will be MD of more than 32, 32. and your meld more than 18. 20. More than mm -hmm. meld 20 carries a prognosis. So how do you manage them? Uh, treat the infection SBP with the antibiotic. Take care of what the antibiotics. The second is question is how do you screen for infection? The chest X-ray, hmm? urine routine and urine culture, blood culture. How many blood Look culture? for any cellulitis. How many blood culture? Two samples, sir. Okay. And then look for screening for infection should be blood culture, urine, urine culture, culture, acidic then fluid culture. If, uh, in if there is ascites, you look for acidic fluid culture. Then chest X-ray. Now, now, Cellular. John Hopkins said you should do a CT thorax because very high incidence of aspergillus in these. Yes. Okay? okay, so look for SBP, look for all the cultures, screening cultures. Yes, sir. And uh, procalcitonin is probably better than C reactive. C -reactive. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So, how do you manage him nutritionally? Uh, 35 to 40 kilocalorie per kg and ideally enteral and protein enteral of one nutrition. enteral nutrition with the uh, um, protein of 1.2 to 1.5 gram per kg. Then, mm, then supplements, other, other nutrition supplements you'll add for alcohol liver disease. Thiamine. Okay, then uh, vitamin B, B group of vitamins, hmm. zinc. Most importantly, you add to your micronutrients. Sing. Micronutrients to these patients. And how do you give? Nutrition. Oral. Oral or enteral nutrition? Which is better? Oral, sir. Enteral. The best is if the patient is not eating, getting at least minimum of 2,000 kilocalories, you need to go on enteral nutrition. Enteral. Then... And enteral nutrition with combination of what has shown to be better results. Enteral nutrition, you will give how? Do you give? Uh, uh, nasogastric or nasogastric? Nasogastric or nasoenteral, how do you give? Continuous or bolus? Continuous. Continuous. How much? You should know how much one drop will contain how many kilocalories. Okay. okay. So you give continuous one. Then you should use trace elements. It should have See. 1 to 1.5 grams this thing. What is the role of albumin? IV albumin in these patients. Uh, he's uh, having SBP, sir. So albumin 1.5 gram. SBP number two. Uh, then also prevention. Uh, his uh, albumin is low. Two point. In this patient. Then HR to prevent. Yeah. Answer. Answer. What is the use uh, of IV albumin in a critically ill patient? 
not with the TV. Uh, Is it a drone? It acts as a helps in the suppression of the. No, answer trial is different for alcoholic hepatitis. Kind of a response, inflammatory response syndrome. Some, please recommend. Sometimes they give albumin to these patients to prevent. Hrs as well as. Prevent AKI infections, drying down the inflammation of portal hypertension, and also. Improve the nutrition. Okay. So enteral nutrition. And anything else has been shown to be enteral nutrition and something else is better? Uh, IV, um, vitamin. IV? Uh, vitamin something else, uh, IV, IV you can give. Uh, along with enteral nutrition, you have some better results than enteral nutrition alone. N-acetylcysteine. So yes. N-acetylcysteine plus enteral nutrition seems to have been better than this thing. Okay. okay. So, what is the definitive management on this patient? Antibiotics, sir. Since he is having SBP, SBP uh, steroids are contraindicated at this point. Okay. So, you give antibiotics if there is an infection. Okay. Okay. So, what is the definitive treatment of alcoholic hepatitis? Uh, the, since he is having severe alcoholic hair, uh, Hepatitis with the DF more than 32. Steroids are the proven treatment, but yeah, steroids are the proven. So, how do you give steroids to these patients? Uh, after rolling out any uh, contraindication for steroids, like infection, GA blade, AK, like that, uh, 40 gram of methylprednisolone to be given per day. Uh, reassess after seven days with uh, release so score. Said, uh, uh, so is there a mortality benefit in alcoholic uh, in patients with critically ill cirrhotics? In critically ill cirrhotics, if there is a hypotension, probably you can give albumin 5% fine drink, but the latest study in NEJM has shown that there is not much of a difference in the mortality of giving critically ill cirrhotics. But in patients who got hypotension and shock, you need to give you can give albumin at better than to give 5% 500 than 20% 100 ml okay but actually the two studies have shown that one study has shown some benefit the other study in NEJ in a critically cirrhotic did not show any benefit in a critical ill cirrhotic yeah. but answer trial is something which is different in a decompensated cirrhosis when you kept on giving albumin you were able to prevent infections you were able to correct hyponatremia you were able to correct AKI and probably reduce the ascites. This is the answer trial, which the albumin went on at 40 grams every week for 14 weeks. In a critical ill cirrhotic, they have not found anything. But if you need to correct hypotension, I think it's better to give 5% 500 ml albumin in these patients. Somebody else asked this question on this. Okay. So you give 40 milligrams per day of what? Uh, Pretnisolone, sir. For how long? Uh, after seven days, the ESS with the Lily score. If it's uh, more than 0.45, stop it. Then that, that that means the patient is not responding to steroid. Not responding to? Steroid. Okay. Then if he responds? If he responds, continue it for 28 days. Hmm. Then after that, uh, it can be either abruptly stopped or can be uh, tapered over next th two to three weeks. Sir. So what does steroid do? Okay. Not two to three weeks. You give 40 for four weeks, then every week, 20 week, 20 milligram every other every week for next two weeks and stop it. Okay. You can't say two or three weeks or no. Correctly, okay, you should sir. tell. Okay, sir. Give for three to four weeks. It's only four weeks and then everything, or you can abruptly stop it. Okay. So, what does the steroid do? What did it do? It, uh, reduce the hepatic inflammation. It it reduced the short term mortality. It reduced the 28 okay. day mortality. Mortality, yes, sir. Mortality in this code. Okay. Now, now there's some sometimes the patient's little score may be less than uh, will be more than 0.45, but clinically is better. Should be continuous steroids. Clinically, the ascites will go, patients eating well, bilirubin is coming down, but he's at the end of the day, it's 0.45. 
should we still stick on to that or there are any other current thoughts on that sure. if you can carefully keep the patients and make sure that he does not develop any infection okay. Okay. you can continue steroids but what is your criteria to say is improving when you, okay. you have not been so excellent excellent so if you have a five five degree five decrease of the score in mel by five supposing it has come down from 25 to 20 and even if the lil score is high then you may can continue steroids provided you don't have an infection okay yes, but if you do not continue the steroids the only worry will be the infections come on the second or third week is there any other combination drug which is tried with corticosteroids pendoxifilin uh, is tried NAC was a trial which showed that that has got no this thing. What is the NAC, trial? NAC, uh, NSTL system also stop. tried, sir. No, oh, no. What is the stop trial? Stop A trial. Stop A trial was it? Stop, stop A trial. Stop. stop A trial did not show pentoxyl in so there is no role for pentoxyl. So you have some addition of probiotics and antibiotics, and uh, you can sometimes use corticosteroids plus uh, amoxicillin and clavulic acid shown to be some benefit in some recent studies. So if the patients are becoming better, but your LIL score is still less than, more than 0.45, case to case basis, you can continue steroids if you are able to show that the MEL or will things will go on it. Okay. So there are a lot of other things. You have uh, sometimes probiotics, you have the trial with in, uh, infliximab, yes. you have tried with some of this uh, uh, and then you have fecal microbiota transplantation fmt has been used and fmt has been used not through the colon but through the rice tube into the small bowel that's also has been used but as it is now the cornerstone supposing somebody responds to steroids what will be the cause of illness his bilirubin is normal his BTINR because 1.2, albumin goes up to 3.6. Very high DF scores. It's more than 68 or 70. We don't give. If the melt is more than 40. We don't give steroids. Okay. Sometimes some people say a melt cutoff of 88. Don't give steroids. No, I'm sorry. DF score of more than 88. Don't give steroids because the mortality is very high. If the melt is more than 22 or 24, sometimes some it is better that you go for a straightaway transport. GM CS has been tried. It has been tried only in the Indian context. I don't, don't think the John Hopkins group, the Mayo or Easel group have really agreed that the GSCM has been tried as a part of treatment for ACNF. Role of liver transplantation. Uh, since he is a um... Severe alcoholic hepatitis. If he is not respond, not responder to steroid, he can consider for early liver early, transplant. Early liver transplant. Okay, early liver transplantation, provided there is no infection, infection and the patient is infection. too sick to transplant. So what is the what is the survival of liver transplant in alcoholic hepatitis? Is it good? Uh, five years survival is around. One year survival is 90%. 90%. Two year survival is still 80%. So it's still good. What is your only worry of transplant in a alcoholic liver? Recidivism, sir. Alcohol what, recidivism. what is the recidivism now so far? Um, 30 to 50 percentage can. 15 percent. Bigger study out of out of uh, the uh, out of the uh, French study where 35 people were dead, only two had recidivism after 760 days okay so they're not much of a recidivism so the previous rule that you have to have a six month waiting period is gone so we can do an early liver transplant the only worry of an early liver transplant in alcoholic hepatitis will be that there's a very high incidence of fungal infection so yes. we start in our center day one antifungals then they can have a lot or most of these patients have an underlying cardiomyopathy where they can go for a stress cardiomyopathy so, in general, you need to, uh, in alcoholic hepatitis, as you said, nutrition, you can give N-acetylcysteine, 
Importantly, look, look for early for infections with appropriate cultures. Steroids are the cornerstone if he is eligible. If he is ineligible for steroids, who are the candidates who are ineligible for steroids? Majid. Who have, who have infection, number one, sir. Number, number two, two if, 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 if number two is if it's a DF or a MELD score is very high. As yeah, very, very high DF of more than 88, MELD mode of more than 30, then? Yes. Uh, third point will be patient has got a GI bleed and patient has got okay. acute kidney injury. So we don't give steroids in these patients. Okay. So I think this is in general. So this patient is predominantly. So what we discussed is we looked at the clinical criteria of alcoholic hepatitis. We looked at the biochemical criteria of alcohol. How do we diagnose? Kindly read through all the cage criteria C, audit C. Uh, we looked at what is ACLF in alcoholic hepatitis. We looked how do we look at how do we prognosticate alcohol hepatitis. We looked at what is the role of liver biopsy and we looked at the prognostic factors of liver biopsy in patients with alcoholic hepatitis. Can histology tell you whether they will respond to steroids or not? And what are the poor prognostic? Then we had in 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 this thing we looked at how do you broadly manage this thing. What is the LIL score? And sometimes individually we can go away from the LIL score and look at the reduction of MELD mm -hmm. as a pointer for continuing mm -hmm. steroids. Okay. Sometimes we can start steroids after treating the infection, but we don't need to wait too long. And they found that there's no difference when you give steroids and patients. The only question they ask is: should we stop infection, stop steroids when they are on infection? If the patient is doing well, I don't think they recommend stopping steroids at the infection. You can continue steroids with the, along with the infection unless the patient is becoming very sick. Okay. And what is the role of liver transplantation in these patients? Yeah, I think that was a wonderful coverage. You know, the other other important thing is there will be deviation. You know, the tetrasplenomegaly. Yeah. That deviation will take place somewhere down the line. So the the screen has told us a chronic liver. Not agree. has told that there's a chronic liver disease, but your biopsy has showed both evidence of portal portal fibrosis, cirrhosis, scarring, plus active alcoholic hepatitis. So you should uh, read uh, fantastic grand rounds on alcoholic hepatitis by Philip Mathur in the Journal of Hepatitis 2018 and read the recent alcoholic hepatitis and clinics in liver disease. Okay. And you should uh, read some of the treatises by Ashwin Singhal, where he is only the one who perpetrated that sometimes you need to go beyond the LIL score to treat these patients. And I, I think you have to read Sidhu's paper, no? The bovine yeah, bovine and colostrum, bovine, bovine colostrum. colostrum. Yeah, that, that's, that's all been coming into the newer uh, this one. But still yeah, experimental. I think still yeah. it is experimental. They can just say they know it. The point yeah. is that bovine colostrum, which some of the company gave, was very costly. Yeah. It's two thousand rupees per day. But the guy who comes with alcohol hepatitis is earning is only fifty rupees per day. So okay. research research is going on. No? Sidhu's paper from Ludhiana. So I think you should know about that. I think stop with this case, man. The other case yeah. will take I the think, next That's fine. This is I, wonderful coverage, no? I, I mean, complete coverage on alcoholic hepatitis. But I'll tell you, there will be a deviation after your supposing someone has given you a hint. The registrar has said this is a case of alcoholic hepatitis, and you start going in the direction. Once the lab reports come up, surface, you know, you'll find that. You have to give a wide official after examination. After examination. Give a wider differential and not stick on to alcohol associated hepatitis. I think that is most most important because ascites is minimal. I think clinically they could not pick up. And it was ultrasound that picked up and then they managed to get some paracentesis done. So have a wide differential so that you know you have a wide perspective of the case, alcohol associated and non-alcohol. Very important. The only thing the only I didn't discuss is somebody responds to steroids. 60% tend to remain cirrhotic okay, for the next five years, even though they may not decompensate it, provided you have completely abstained from alcohol. In your treatment, you should also say, how do we prevent relapse? The best drug to use is to prevent relapses. 
naltrexone and acamprosone. Baclofen. Baclofen is naltrexone when there's a severe thing. Baclofen is one drug. And the third thing is uh, then there was a bit of interest because we started doing plex for everything, plasma volume exchange. Is there a role of plasma volume exchange in alcoholic hepatitis triggered ACLF? I think the results are not very, very good. At least in our center, we are not good. We have stopped doing it for alcoholic hepatitis ACLF. Because generally they are infected and you do this if they really worsen on this. And even the John Hopkins shows that they don't do. In case if they're worsening, they rather go for a transplant rather than, than, than a plasma volume exchange. Initially, they used mass, but mass also useful. So alcohol liver disease, I'm not very sure about other centers, but at least now center we have stopped doing for alcohol liver disease rather than we can pitch in more for rather than wasting money and time then go in for a transplant we do with these patients okay that's a very yeah. Yeah. wonderful coverage of a case with alcohol use disorder cirrhosis with the superadded alcoholic hepatitis and possibly a CLF. And I think the management has been very nicely covered. I think every aspect has been covered. But I think in the examination, uh, once a case of alcoholic hepatitis, all these things will be asked. You will be questioned thoroughly because alcoholic liver disease is something which is seen in the wards day in and day out. Day in, day almost yeah. there, in every, almost every time there is a patient. So you are all expected to know everything about the management of alcoholic liver disease. No, it is just like a basic thing. For a gastroenterologist, so you have to know everything about cirrhosis liver, everything about alcoholic liver disease, everything about ACLF, everything about alcoholic hepatitis, etc. Because examiners will not forgive you for making mistakes on these aspects. So we have to be absolutely thorough regarding the management. Then we can mention the consider steatohepatitis. 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 Generally, most of them develop steatohepatitis. 100% develop fatty liver and steatohepatitis. Mm -hmm. That's a time when your bilirubin is normal, your liver enzymes are moderately elevated, but your liver bilirubin is generally normal. They have a they have a palpable liver, but your bilirubin and prothrombin time is normal. Platelets should not have dropped because there's no fibrosis. So when you have a and you have ruled out other causes, head B, hep C, and all those things. So you think of alcohol state of some people call it subclinical hepatitis. Oh, subclinical hepatitis. Yeah, yeah this um, this particular patient is just wondering with such a high bilirubin, no? AST, LT is not that elevated. So the only worry a, we had was he was hepatitis E positive. And, and E positive with no increase again in AST, LT, mm -hmm. no? That so was again against and uh, also even for alcohol, it was just 93 and yeah, 40 right. or something. So in your biopsy, it was more of alcoholic hepatitis and that's why we put him on steroid despite having hepatitis E. Uh, we took a chance on him, otherwise, uh, this one would have been done. Okay. Nice coverage. Thank you, LBK. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Viti. Thank you. Thank you. Viti, sir, looking tired today. <laughs> she was there, no? No, she's left, I think. She was interacting for some time. Okay. Want to conclude, Viti? I think it was, I, uh, it's a great case. So in the initial part, we thought it's a sort of a, a middle-aged person with a mild pain and the short history of jaundice and pain. And the DD was a, a alcoholic liver disease versus acute uh, but carry syndrome versus any other form of uh, acute form of liver disease okay, in the absence of any cholestasis. After we examined the patient, there were some things, deep jaundice, spinohepatomegaly and flaps. That was so, ma'am. Was repeatedly suggesting you have to you may be asked about hematology it's absolutely right because if the spleen is more than what you expect the, the complete direction change will occur and you'll go to hematology okay so you must be very thorough about discussion of moderate splenomegaly severe splenomegaly mild splenomegaly okay. and that is wonderfully covered the hepatitic and non-hepatitic causes of jaundice and all those things are wonderfully covered after evaluation we have found it is uh, after biopsy, especially it's a case of uh, alcoholic hepatitis. So there's no doubt about mm -hmm. the diagnosis part of it. But there will be some question what about the role of uh, hepatitis E in this case. That is a difficult to explain because hepatitis E is positive, IgM is positive, but the enzyme changes are not thrown up. Probably because uh, there is sufficient other changes in the liver because there's already uh, alcoholic liver disease okay. going on. So, Probably it's not like a straightforward hepatitis E, acute hepatitis. That may be the reason why it is not. 
the rest of the thing have been well covered please go and revise about alcohol hepatitis acl and read read about this and revise it okay and keep notes most importantly is keep notes that's what i would say you will not be able to read sosinger or sheila sherlock on the previous day of examination so keep notes and read from your notes okay thank you 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 th